So I was, I, the Third Circuit came out with a decision recently, um, the Oberdorf decision, where it was a Section 230 issue because someone came up to Amazon, bought a, um, I believe it was like a dog walker, a dog leash. Um, they were using it. Um, I feel bad for the lady. The leash um, it didn't work. Through a third party. Through a third staff, party. This, yes, thank you for. So she was using the leash, it broke, and it hit her eye, and I believe it led to permanent blindness in, in one eye. Um, she attempted to sue and wanted to sue the intermediary, but couldn't because Amazon didn't have any verified information about the seller or where they were located. So we were in the sort of um, twilight of, of Section 230 where they wanted to hold the person accountable who did the speech or did the conduct but there wasn't any information for them to be able to act on it. So she sued Amazon instead. The Third Circuit basically said that Section 230 didn't apply, uh, and instead the product liability of Pennsylvania applied. And crucially, one of the things that they, they noted here, um, and I don't believe it was dicta, um, was that one of the reasons why they were willing to let product uh, liability apply here is because Amazon didn't take any sort of actions to to get information about this seller so that someone could sue them if they engaged in some sort of product liability or, or, um, or bad faith. Um, so Gus Hurwitz wrote about this case and what I thought was really interesting about it was that it, it showed the court trying to figure out a way to, to, um, to incentivize companies to have this information so that individuals could act and make sure that people were held accountable. And that's always been sort of one of the main talking points that I've used about Section 230, right? That this is not about, um, that, that this is specifically about holding people who say the speech accountable for their speech. You can sue the person who defames you, right? You don't sue the, the platform or the website that hosts that speech, right? Um, but what do you do when you can't sue that person, when they're anonymous? Um, uh, so Gus, Hor Gus Horace wrote about um, a, a proposal that he had after reading this case where basically said that he, he would like um, people to consider um, an analysis of the type of, um, of website, whether it's Amazon or Google or Facebook, um, and their ability to require people to give up their information to the company about where their address or their name so that if there is a suit, they would be able to provide that information to allow someone to sue them. Um, I mean, there are obvious privacy implications about that. I'm not sure I'm very comfortable with that. But one of the things that I appreciate about it was at the very least, it was an attempt to deal with this very real concern when you're not able to have any sort of compensation or remedy when um, when you've been wronged here. And if you'll allow me just to, to bug a little bit more about this, I, I think it's actually important that people deal with this because uh, there was a case that I read um, of an individual who was using Grindr, which is a, a gay dating app, um, and broke up with his boyfriend or whatever uh, and decided to use pictures of his boyfriend to create a profile and basically harass this individual. He would contact people and direct them to his ex-boyfriend's home at any time of day or any time of day, uh, time of day as well. And this individual wanted some sort of way to prevent this from happening. Um, and Griner has Section 230 liability, right? Um, so I, um, I'm not entirely sure what the best way to, to fix those sort of like anonymous sort of situations are. Um, but I, I, I do hope that as we move forward on this, even if you're an individual like me who is very pro Section 230, I think we have to realize that there are consequences that come with that. 